Trading futures and options on futures involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all traders and investors. Oftentimes in futures trading, you have a high combination of leverage and volatility. And although this could be an equation for opportunity, it's also an equation for risk. So be careful, only fund your futures trading account with risk capital. My personal definition of risk capital is money I could afford to lose doesn't change my lifestyle or overly stress me out. As human beings, we make bad decisions when we're under stress, so be in a good spot. Remember, micro contracts could be friends. Take it easy on the day trade margins. You get plenty of leverage without maxing out on those day trade margins on a regular basis. We'll be taking a look at a real-time simulated live NinjaTrader trading platform today, and none of this should be construed as trade or investment advice. Past performance not indicative of future. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to See the Futures. My name is Jim Cagnino with Ninja Trader. It is December 20th, 2023. The last See the Futures show of the calendar year 2023. And what a great year it's been. What better way to finish strong than with Jimmy Iorio live with us today? Good morning, Jimmy. Good. Thanks for having me, Jim. Happy Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, all that. Yeah, same to you. Same to you. I'm looking forward to it uh, for sure. You know, we did a lot of work this year. We did an awful lot of broadcast, awful lot of shows, and I'm gonna take a little bit of a break next week and just Good hang you. out. Good for yeah. you. Yeah. How about you guys? What are you doing for Christmas? Just hanging out with the fam? Uh, yeah. We yeah. We don't travel anywhere. My in-laws come with over to my house on Christmas, which is fine because they eventually leave. I, none of them watch the podcast. I think so. I can say whatever I want about my in-laws, and then we go over to my niece's house later in the day. So it should be really fun. Yeah, well, life wouldn't go round and round without in loss. I mean, you got it <laughs> exactly. I love them. <laughs> oh my goodness! So this has been a this has been a, a really interesting year, a pivotal year. You know, this whole potentially Fed uh, uh, cycle is going to start reversing. Maybe Santa Claus rally in full effect. What's your take here at the end of the year? So we're all rate traders, whether we like it or not. To put that in perspective, on October 31st, U.S. two-year yields were trading at 5.1. Now they're trading about 4.38. In that same time, S&P's had a blistering 15% rally just in, just in two months, and it corresponds with the rates going down. We were all waiting for the pivot, and the pivot was then bolstered. Uh, are these rates coming up right here? Yeah, so I have the, so this is perfect, perfect timing. I have the, I have the CME group micro yield on the top. And then I have just a regular E-mini S&P daily on the bottom just to kind of see what the correlation is. Yeah. And um, I had that queued up. I didn't know you were going to mention it off the top of the bat, but here we go. Good. I should have, I should have told you. But uh, so again, so I think that rates are the dog and everything else is the tail. And um, that's going to continue. So then when on December 13th, when the chairman came out and kicked the door open for basis points of cuts in 2024. Now, what's interesting is that the market then, the Fed Fund futures market, immediately then takes that to mean, he means more than 75, and they price in 150. So yields have just cratered. I don't fully understand why 10-year yields have cratered, and I think it's more of a market positioning thing than anything else. But the rest of the curve seems to make sense to me. Two-year yields going down if the Fed is potentially going to ease. And by the way, I do think they're going to ease. And I don't subscribe to the thing. I'm curious to get your take on it too. The notion that some people said, well, oh, the Fed must see something. I don't think they see anything. I think they realize that the labor, the labor numbers have been somewhat obfuscated and the labor market is weakening. And again, now I know I don't care about politics. I genuinely don't. If you look back at historically, I think you could make the case to some people that it's reasonable to assume that an election year a Federal Reserve might be a little more generous um, for fear of irritating the people in power. Is that an OK way to say it, Jim, or no? Yeah, no, it is. And, you know, I, I've actually done some research on this and I've gone back 30 years to try to figure out um, the relationship between Fed funds in a presidential year. And I can't I can't find a correlation. I, I don't okay. think there's anything there because you because what happens is you have some kind of bigger event that's happening anyway, causing Fed funds to move, whether it's COVID, mortgage crisis, dot-com bubble, whatever it is. These other things are in the background that are overpowering, kind of. But I did kind of look at, okay, election year, what happens, what happens, what happens. I'm not, I didn't see a huge, a huge correlation there. So I don't okay, know. And I, can a, be, I can be knocked off that thesis too, by the way. I just thought it was worth considering, but I appreciate you going back and doing that work. Thanks. Yeah, but now it's different now in, 
you know, 2024 is different than it was, you know, 1980, right? So of you have a whole a whole set of different factors, and you know, half the half the FOMC is appointed, right? So right, we'll see we'll see what happens. One thing that Blue Putnam told me though, and I, I'm interested in your opinion here, is the um, uh, when you look at that FOMC, the um, CME Group Fed Funds tool, tracking all four or five cuts the next calendar year. Um, he did suggest that that tends to be overly aggressive on the upside and the downside in predictions. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that when it was pricing in 25 or 50 basis points of cuts in 2024, then I thought that to me is nonsense. If the Fed is pushed to cut, it'll mean things are deteriorating considerably and they're deteriorating fast. That's the only way they're going to be knocked off the, the neutrality, let this run mark. So to me, it seems like more logical that if they were going to cut, they'd be cutting as much as 150 basis points. But to Blue's point, this, this the futures market, we always say, oh, the smart money, but it has not been the smart money over the last two years. So I get what he's saying, and it, it, I'm not basing everything on that, but I do fundamentally believe that things are changing. I think that some of the numbers skewed to making things look more positive than that they were in the last six months. I'm not even saying that that was intent. I'm just saying the way they're structured. And I think finally we're going to start to feel the efficacy of the Fed rate hikes, which were delayed for so long. And we've talked about why I think they were delayed on this show, but I'll give a quick 30 seconds of it again. The five years prior to the first rate hike, U.S. 10-year yields averaged 1.96, an historically low 1.96. The point I'm trying to make is that it gave everybody opportunity to roll their loans out duration, not just mortgages, but businesses as well. So I think people were largely insulated, not completely insulated, largely insulated from the rate hikes in the near term. But I think it's starting to gather steam as people have to borrow money. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, we saw the NBA Mortgage Brokers Association print this morning was 6.83% for the conventional. And that's the first time we saw a six print in a while. Yeah. Yeah. So I think now people will actually start refinancing and moving and buying new homes. And then they'll be have to pay more before they were just holding on to their mortgage like grim death because they're not going to give up their 3% to roll it into an 8%. But they may start to think about it if they had plans of moving uh, when it gets down into the sixes. Right, right, right. And that's like a, a sigh of relief. It's like, all right, finally exactly. back in sixes. You know, the other interesting yep. fact that I, I went back to 1970 and I calculated the effective fund rate from 1970 till today average 4.91 average wow okay now i will push Shocked. back on that and say that that's the average over the last 40 years but i do think that this unholy relationship between low rates and federal and state regulations and taxes kind of um, surfaced over the last 20 years making our mm -hmm. economy more addicted to lower rates than we had been in the past that's the only thing i will say that might and i hate being a this time it's different guy but i think this time it could be different yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. One last thing on the yield curve real quick. I mean, we're we're still inverted, right? Two and 10 year. I'm, and I'm going with the micro yields because they're right here on my screen. And we're, we're talking, what, 40 basis point inversion still. It's not getting any better. No, it's not getting any better. It actually got worse, which to me is so confusing. I understand why two-year yields are going lower if we think the Fed's going to eat. I don't understand why 10-year yields are going lower in response to that, particularly when you throw in the fact that sometime soon, the Treasury is going to have to start issuing more longer end bonds once they tap the demand on the short end, which they've been concentrating on. So I, mm -hmm. I am long a steepener. I'm long 10-year yields and short two-year yields. Taking a little heat on the trade, but I'm not deterred yet. Okay. So you're doing you're, you're trading the, 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 the inversion, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, right. I think we will head back to zero at some point in time. And the, my thesis for the trade was twofold, is that well, actually, I just said why it was. So I don't need to go over that again. That would just be being redundant. I think that they're eventually going to start lowering short end rates quickly within the next four months. Yeah. And on that note, let me just toggle over really quickly to a, um, well, I'll just go to a weekly. Uh, well, I'll go to a daily since it's color coded better. This is a 10 yep. year, it says sloppy uh, daily 10 year note. This is price, right? If you're trading price, yep. you're, trading the, you're trading the 10 year note. And it seems to me, that when we hit this low back here in middle of October, it's because we hit that 5% yield. And that was as far yep. as this market's ever going to go. Does that make yep. sense or no? No, that makes perfect sense. And we've talked about how the big, huge round psychological numbers matter in many assets, but particularly matter 
in these heavily traded, um, heavily these futures markets with the 10 year and the two year, because so many options are there written at 5%. Nobody writes an, uh, an option for 4.98 because they just round it up when it's doing in advance. So that's a big deal. So we turned it around at 5%. And now this chart to me looks very bullish price, which is against my trade and my fundamental thesis, but it doesn't matter because it's you know locked in with the two year. So it matters what the two year does too. But to me, it looks like you drew that little uh, whatever uh, pennant perfectly. And yep. I think if it starts to trade above some of those levels that it does have the potential to fly, mm-hmm. maybe even what, if, what are uh, 10 year yields trading now? Could, could they earn about three, three, like 90 something? What is it? Yeah. 390. Yeah. So I think maybe to go to 375, the next psychological number is perfectly reasonable if it breaks out of that, um, that little pennant. Okay. So you're going quarter point increments. Um, yep. Those, okay. I gotcha. Yeah, no, I, we're bullish here. And the pennant uh, measured move here, I can't take credit for totally. It's Tom Schneider's work. I have to say nice, it all out. Nice, nice job, Tom Schneider. Is that does that top correspond with about a th- uh, three and three quarter? Do you know? I don't know. That's a good I question. Yeah. I can try to yeah, figure I bet that out. It, I bet it does from a quick eyeball. Yeah, let's let's kind of pivot over to the Nasdaq. I'm going to throw up a micro Nasdaq. Sure. because there's more volume in it and right. I, I get more confidence in the data points if that makes any okay. sense yeah it makes perfect sense to me so, so anyway here, i mean this yeah go ahead tell me what you're seeing here's the way i would measure that move so you just drew a box in there which we'll call it the consolidation period so to measure the rise from uh the beginning of the uh, end of october uh, to go back to the left the rise from there till it enters that uh, consolidation period and then once we broke out of it an equal move left, which means it seems like we have about 25% more of a move higher. So that that length from when we break out. So I'm going to go ahead and just do it. Look at that, Those baby. Those are beautiful tools. So to so me, that would be, would be my objective up here. Now, here's something, though, that I was just noticing in my S&P charts, too, because the, the stock has been waiting for the pivot. The uh, NASDAQ minus the Magnificent 7, because they were marching to their own drum for the last two years. But the NASDAQ minus those has been waiting for the pivot as well, too. Remember that, that the tech stocks, the growth names tend to do better at lower rates because that discounted cash flow model. So I have no problem with the stock market ringing in the lower rates, the Fed pivot and rally. I don't think they're the best buy in this. And I think when I look at the S&P, and I don't want you to switch over there yet because I still like this chart to look at what that objective is. But just uh, flirting with all-time highs right now, I think they ex- expended a lot of energy getting there. So I'm not totally jumping on the S&P. I might be interested in trying to squeeze a little more out of this NASDAQ for that remark. But I will say to people too, is that option volatility implied in the, in the options is so incredibly low right now that you can keep these long positions and easily buy put protection that's given away at you know really really cheap levels. Then how does that how does that affect price in the in the in the in the cash market in the futures market? So how you mean when the, the cheap options? Yeah. So as we have rallied since October, volatility has gone for the measured by the VIX. There's, me, there's many ways to to measure it. Has gone from about twenty two to about twelve or eleven, meaning that we're not pricing in risk as much, which to me is sometimes a harbinger of a bad thing, but it also presents itself an opportunity because you can keep your long positions on in stocks and then use and, and it, like buy insurance by buying uh, those cheap puts. Okay. That makes total sense to me. That makes total sense to me. You know, right now, at least the last eight days or so, it's nothing but, you know, I don't even know when the Santa Claus rally is supposed to start. That was, co- that was coined in, I think Tom told me 1972 and um, it, it seems to me like it started. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I don't know what the rules are. Either. I hate. I sometimes hate those anecdotal colloquialism trader talk things, but uh, sometimes they seem to work. And this time certainly did. But again, I will say that what I started the show with saying, we are all rate traders. Mm-hmm. Rates started to go down. Risk assets started to go up. This is, that part of it is not rocket science, in my opinion. Okay. So, but, so from a 2024 outlook point of view, um, now our expectations are measured a little differently, right? So our expectations aren't a rate cut, it's how many and when. Mm-hmm. That's going right. to drive, it, would that drive then equity markets and based on what the reality is on, on that okay, so, case? So usually, looking at history, 
when we switch from a hiking cycle to a cutting cycle, which is the, the time period between the two is usually alarmingly short. I want to say three months, but I don't have exactly in front of me right now. But when we switch to the, the easing cycle, it's usually because something big has happened, which usually corresponds with a significant pullback in the stocks before the easing cycle actually happens. I, this is one of my concerns and one of the reasons I have taken every rally opportunity to bolster my put positions on both um, the uh, S&P and the NASDAQ. Because I think it could happen. I think it's going to present a, a great buying opportunity, but it could be significantly, uh, it could be a 10 to 12% break in a matter of days once we start seeing what the actual reason is for the Fed to potentially ease. Let me ask you, and if this is personal, you know, and, put, sure. and poke me in the eye and say, mind your own business, but what's your dur- what's your duration on the puts? Like, is are you talking about uh, long dated or are you, you know, day to day? I have I have a mixture. I have January 19th and I have February, I think it's February 29th. It's February 29th a day this oh, year. I thought that's what it said. Yeah, I think it's a leap year. So I have February 29th, but I don't want to ride those all out till they go to zero. So I will pick a time to flip those and get more duration before while they still have some value. So I'll play with that position quite a bit. And I hopefully even the January 19th ones, I hope, um, you know, I, I have an opportunity like a quick pullback to roll those into something further out. Cause I'd rather have, I'd rather have through March right now. Totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. All right. Appreciate that. Let's, let's, let's kind of pivot over to February gold. Love I think that's the front month now for uh, February gold. You know, my charts, I don't know how messy these are or not. But, um, you know, the last few days have been consolidation kind of sideways. Yeah, I think a settle above 2050, which is the top of those wicks, right? Well, the top of these wicks, 60s, 2060. Oh, 2060, that's what I'm going to say. Yeah. A settle above 2060, to me, looks like the game is on. Now, the, the fundamental thesis is threefold. Currency is weaker because of lower rates. Gold should have a tailwind because of low rates. Now, also, and I just wrote a piece today for Fox, which I'm going to be on tomorrow, saying that, you know, central banks, I don't know if you've noticed or seen that central banks thirst for gold over the last year and a half has been almost unquenchable. They're buying it around the globe. I am not naive enough to believe in the de-dollarization theory that these are going to move away in any significant fashion, but I believe that others are believing that that could possibly happen and that could boost the price of gold. Uh, pretty quickly. I do. I think that gold is the place I want to be probably even the most in 2024. And I have a lot on. And if it settles above 2060 and looks like a building a base, I may add to that. So that's almost like a FOMO kind of thing, what you just said. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like with that, and that's what our job really is to do. You can look at the fundamental story all you want and come to your conclusion on it. But then the more important thing is how are other people going to interpret that fundamental story? And that's where technical analysis comes in too. Yeah. So interestingly enough, so let me just, I'm going to pivot for a second here because I, I kind of agree with what you're saying, but when I, you know, let's take a look at the British pound because th- this morning we had a, we had a, we had a, we had a, a CPI print that was dovish, right? Mm-hmm. So you, in the UK, we're looking at the UK, yeah. British pound, sterling cable, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, a month over, it's still high, right? But core is like tracking 5.1 where they forecast 5.6. And every time you think the dollar is going to lose a lot of traction, something like this happens. Yeah. So, and that's confusing. But I do think on the other side of that coin, I think there's a lot, the, a lot of the economic um, data has been deteriorating in the UK and throughout the Eurozone. And I think people think that inflation is going to take care of itself. Uh, I know that, like you said, the number is still unusually high, but I think the hopes are way, way higher there that it's coming off mm-hmm. alongside a, um, a rapidly weakening economy. So I, but again, I, I, I don't know where this puts the currency market because there's so many, there's cross currents because the same things are happening here are the same things that are happening there. So where does that shake us out? I don't know. And that's where we come back to tingles. And I look at the, um, the, uh, the little bit of a pennant that's forming in the last four days. And I guess I would say that line to the upside, oh, this is the, the pound. So I can't read that number. Is that 120 something? The top um, line? So my, my red line up here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 27, almost yeah. 28, 128. See, I think a move above that um, is a sign for me to buy the pound, but the fundamental story that has to accompany that 
is that our problems here economically are accelerating, which is going to start us pricing in more eases and actually maybe even realize some eases. And that's what's going to drive the dollar down and the pound and the euro up. Uh, That's my base case there. Yeah, no, I agree. And I was surprised to see this big move down, to be honest with you. I thought, you know, we can go currency peer by currency peer. It's all, they're all a little different. But um, again, you know, the tug of war between interest rates between two sovereign countries. Yeah. And, you know, and just in Germany, you know, is the, their two year has collapsed right alongside our two year in the same time frame from late October. But again, they're sitting at you know two point three. We're at four point four on the two year. So they're they don't have as much um, dry powder to fight things as we do. So I just toggled over to the Euro FX, by the way, on that. That's comment. a chart I like. And let's see what we got cooking here. V-shaped recovery, double top, pause. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, like this one's interesting to me and here's how I would trade it gun to my head. You said I had to take a position right now. I'd rather be short than long, just because I think that's a lot of tough sledding on the upside, but I think the big and good move, the way I want to trade it is wait for it to get above that box. And then I think it's going to fly. And that corresponds with my thesis about, uh, the weak dollar. A lot of my, a lot of my trades are centered around the fact that the government is going to keep spending. We are about to add a third war to start borrowing money uh, that could hurt the currency, um, not to start a third war. I don't, I don't, did, I said that wrong and I'm not even trying to be political. There is concern that there will be a third major conflict on this planet starting, the one in Africa. And if we start sending money to that, we're already, we already committed 170 billion to Ukraine. I think we are spending too much money and that is going to start showing up in a weaker US dollar, which will provide tailwinds to these other major currencies. So I want to be long the euro. Technically speaking, I wouldn't be yet. It's got to settle above that box. Hmm, I got it. I got it. Well, it's certainly what's the your, fast moving. What's your app- thesis on trading? So, <laughs> I agree with the idea that we start. Uh, we you start getting candles closing above this area of uh, resistance that we highlighted with the rectangle. Then, then, then it could be off to the races. We have a lot of upside potential here, and I'm also looking at this moving average cross. There's all sorts of reasons why this could kind of be a positive kind of trade up. Euro, it's pro- the euro zone. I, I, I mean, what do you think about the euro zone, where you have many countries that you, ha- you know, just imagine being on that board and making, you know, you know, and making sausage. It's not going to be pretty. Well, just I, the. the- Leader of the French Central Bank the other day said, we should be cutting. And I was like, I thought the only thing that dawned on me is it's so easy to say these things when you're not the one who actually has to pull the lever. It's not his turn right now. So, yes, to your point, there's not only is these conflict, conflicting real opinions, there's conflicting things said for political reasons as well. So there are moments where I'm not sure trying to juggle all those countries at once. I'm not sure they know if they're a footer on horseback that's the old expression right i think that something like you said how to make the sausage there gets very very difficult because there's so many cooks in the kitchen wow let's, we can use all the metaphors today but anyway i think the trade is more of a function of the u.s dollar weakness than any sort of inherent strength in these countries i just think we continue spending money with no no nothing in sight to slow us down and by the way can i yeah. add something real quick too yeah i have yeah. long I have long said this too. Republicans getting in office usually doesn't slow down the spending. The only time anyone objects to spending is when Democrats are in office, Republicans object to spending, which, by the way, I'll take it because usually we're spending too much. But as soon as Republicans get into office, they tend to be profligate spenders as well. So I have very little confidence that they're going to fix everything from a budget standpoint. So you're saying no matter who's in office, we're going to be spending. Bingo. That's just kind of what we do at this point in time. Okay. That's a politically neutral statement. I, I'm comfortable. Neutral. Yeah. I hit them all. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh gosh. <laughs> all right. So let's, let's keep moving here. We got a little bit of time. We got some time left here. Um, is there any particular market you want me to pull up real quick or. Can you, are you um, interested in Bitcoin? Do a lot of your guys trade Bitcoin? Cause I find it to be a fascinating trade. Yeah. I'm going to put it up right here. This is interesting too. And I've, uh, go ahead. Here's this is the nano Bitcoin. I use that mm-hmm. because it has a ton of volume in it. This is the Coinbase sure. Derivatives Exchange, um, so it has really good good charting. So here's okay. here's a. I don't know why I'm still in this. Yeah, December 2023. That's right. That's right. Yeah, because they're monthly, right? Yeah. So here's what's been fascinating to me. 
we put in that high, that green candle, that um, recent high, which I'm 44 and change, whatever it was. Um, that's about December 12th, December 13th, I believe. So the same time the Fed officially pivots, the dollar goes lower, yields collapse across the curve. Bitcoin uses that time to pull back and correct. Now, that was wildly perplexing to me. Weak dollar, lower rates are supposed to be tailwinds for crypto, if we believe what we've been told all this time. So I've been watching for days and days going, this has to be just a corrective phase from having just an, a stellar year in 2023, up at, at its high up like 180% in 2023. Um, a lot of it was um, good news off the, the Bitcoin ETF and the pending approval, but that's all at some point in time been priced in. So we saw a little bit of corrective phase and then boom, today we start moving out of what looks like a, a bull pennant. And I think to me, this could be suggestive of higher highs still. And particularly, I want to see how it trades tomorrow and see if it takes out the high of this green candle. Do you like this chart too? I do. And I, I, I mean, and, and I'm going to ask you, I, I mean, I liked the, the regulatory environment here. The, the stronger the regulatory environment, the better off this market. This is a case of regulation's good, I think, right? That's when what we they see say. This. So in two, two things, right? Because one, they'll say that some regulation of it gives its validity. And if the regulation gets too stringent, they'll say they'll, the, the, the real Bitcoin faithful will say they're scared of it. They're trying to stomp it out. And that may be something that draws more people to it. But again, the, the crazy Bitcoin holders will make a fundamental bullish case no matter what you throw at them. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes I don't always agree with them. And again, if you guys watching are crazy Bitcoin holders, I'm halfway with you. So don't take it as too much of an insult. <laughs> I, I just don't, this market's not going away, right? There was a point in time when I thought this is not going to last very long, but it is not uh, going to go away. This is, this is an important marketplace. People participate in it. I, and, you know, I don't know who trades it. I don't know what the commitment of traders looks like, but um, yeah. it's certainly a huge rally. I told you why I've been bullish on it all year. And every time I've gone on different uh, TV shows, they want to know some complicated answer. And it's no, BlackRock is getting on board. BlackRock is the biggest asset manager in the world. They are important and they are connected. And if they want something to succeed, they have the power to make it succeed, in my opinion. Well, it's succeeding. Let's really quickly here. I do want to cover crude oil real quickly with sure, sure. You know, the drama going on in the Red Sea, uh, Suez Canal. Um, we seem to have a little bit of a, a bounce off the, you know, we had a 60 handle not too long ago. I, mm -hmm. What do you make of that? So you remember how, how bullish I've been, uh, on crude. I'm less bullish on crude now. And I'll tell you what, we just had Doomberg on our podcast, by the way. You know who Doomberg is, right? The green chicken? Yeah, I subscribe to his uh, his, yeah, his substack. Yeah. He's fabulous. And he's yeah. a, a great energy analyst. And he was making a couple cases. Um, one, the Biden administration has kind of quietly pivoted back toward fossil fuels over the last few months. They've more loudly pivoted back towards nuclear energy over the last few months. Um, he thinks this, these both are not particularly supportive of the price of crude, particularly when you throw in how um, poorly natural gas, well, natural gas historically has been trading very cheaply and how fungible they are. He thinks that the upside is going to be tougher sledding, and he has convinced me of that too. And then I look at this chart and say, this chart does nothing for me really on the upside. I think it would have to settle above that red candle from back on what uh, day was that? Maybe the 28th. Yeah, that red candle's wick, not the wick. I think just the body of those red and green candles. It'd have to settle okay. above there and build a base just because it has a lot of highs over there. You know, you see that? So for me to get, yeah, that you drew it perfectly. If it could settle above there and grow comfortable there, then I'd believe a couple things were happening. I, I believe that the global <laughs> slowdown might be now the recipient of central bank liquidity all over the world, not just here. And that could fuel an, a little bit of an economic rebound. I don't think that's happening anytime soon. Uh, I, so again, I, I've lost my zeal for crude, and I haven't lost that much money on it because uh, you know some of the names have done okay, particularly in the rate environment. I got it. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. I mean, this has kind of been an interesting kind of rally corresponding with the equity rally. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't. I'm not. I don't know if there if there's a good correlation there or not. To be honest with you, I'm not sure either. Eh? Nor am I sure if there's a good correlation between the price of crude and how it is inflationary or disinflationary. Because you can say, well, the price of crude goes into everything and it fuels inflation. But you can also say the price of gas at the pump starts pulling liquidity out of the average buyer's pocket. So I have never been comfortable picking one side of if high crude prices or low crude prices help or hurt inflation or disinflation. 
Yeah. By the way, boots on the ground. I drove uh, with my son from Indianapolis down to Charleston a couple days ago and gas was cheap as chips. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why uh, that's why uh, Powell pivoted. He filled up his car that morning. It was like, hey, things are cheaper <laughs> than they used to be. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. All right. Any event, we're up against time, Jimmy. I so appreciate you helping us finish strong here at the end of the year and all of your participation in the See the Future shows. You and Bobby, you've been awesome. Thank you. You guys are awesome for having us, and uh, I really appreciate all this. And to uh, Tom and uh, Justin, have a Merry Christmas, you guys, as well. Yeah. Same to you. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Producers, Happy New Year's. Yeah. Yeah. You, you got, too, Jason, yeah. got Jason in the background. We got a new producer, too. Kevin, you haven't met him yet. Kevin, so all right, uh, Kevin, Kevin, Jason, and Tom, you guys are the best. Yeah, we and we have some big plans uh, for next year for the streams, and you guys are, uh, you know, front and center there. So looking forward to it. Love it, love it. Thank you, guys. All right, having said all that, everybody, great. Thank you for being here uh, on See the Futures last show of 2023. Hopefully, we'll we will see you at opening range bars closing the rest of the week. In the meantime, most important message, especially going into the holidays, be safe out there, be good to each other. See you soon.